We have thousands of people who go missing every year just here in the United States, and there's no discrimination on the missing. They are young, old, black, white, male or female, even children. It's time to stop. 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 Welcome at Chase and a Murderer Talking News. My name is Debbie, and we are on part six of this Life Beyond the Grave series. So far, we're learning that Chad Daybell is, he's, he really enjoys living uh, this life where he is looking at the afterlife. Not that I'm saying that there isn't an afterlife or am I making fun of anybody that believes in afterlife. But we know that Chad is using it in a manipulative way and he's using it to an extreme. In fact, he thinks he's the most gifted person around most of the people that surround him. And sadly, and what we're going to learn in part six is he likes to use it in order to manipulate others. And this manipulation ends up hurting so many people because he's hurting the people that truly believe in th these kinds of things and believe that he has this super power in order to communicate with the other side to God and all these great leaders. Before we move forward, I want to share a few things about the Mormon religion so that when you hear these terms, you might understand them a little bit better. So. We hear the word wards men mentioned very often. So these are congregations of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, and they are organized geographically, and members attend and worship services near their home. So when they attend a church in their area, it's considered a ward or a branch. And the leader of that ward is called a bishop. Several wards make up a stake. And the leader of the stake is called the president. Next, I want to share the priesthood. You have the Melchizedek priesthood, which is also referred to as the high priest, which is the highest priesthood of the holy order, order of the son of God, or simply the high priesthood. The church currently has 15 areas outside of North America and 10 inside for a total of 25 six area presidencies have been created for the church's 10 areas in north america so the priesthood we hear the term 70 mentioned several times which is the priesthood office in the mel's Kizadak priesthood they're also considered a traveling minister or a special witness special witness of Jesus Christ. They are in charge of um, with like missions of preaching the gospel to the entire wor world if I can speak right guys <laughs> under the direction of the 12 apostles which you'll hear often. Then you have the Aaronic priesthood holders which generally prepare, bless, and administer sacrament. They also collect fast offerings, perform church and community service, assist in ministering, and occasionally perform baptisms. And so there's a little bit more to it, but we're going to keep it at that. And, um, and so Chad wrote a book on the Aaronic priesthood. You often hear Chad complaining, or kind of complaining, that he and his family never get past a certain point in the church leadership 
he seems to be very aggravated by that. And another term that we hear is the temple recommend. Something you will hear that Lori is seeking. And um, we just lately, we heard it through audio where she had said, you know, either I'm going to kill somebody or you're going to give me a temple recommend. So the temple recommend permits Latter-day Saint uh, members to enter one of the face temples. An adult member of the church receives two interviews to receive a temple recommend. Once by the member of a local um, bishop, then by the member of their state presidency. So that's a few terms I wanted to teach you guys about, at least give you a brief overview of it. Now we're going to move forward um, in Chad's uh, evolution in this case. Now we're learning that Chad Daybell takes this new job and he's working um, for a publisher that basically publish LDS material. It, it comes in varieties of sports, novels, just regular novels and nonfiction. And during this period of Chad's life, he is having all these experiences with uh, visions and seeing things that are going to happen in the future seeing spirits but this is what he says chad says that he's holding all of these experiences back he didn't want to put them in his first books and the reason for that is because he said quote i feared that my family and friends might think i had gone crazy end quote so he's becoming a little bit more confident although chad believes that he has this connection to the lord and that this connection is very sacred. This is something he keeps to himself and those sacred experiences are not included in his book. And later on when he does start to include some things, he's still excluding the, even the most irrational and how can I word this? mind-blowing ideas to himself still. Chad is thrilled to be working for the LDS publishing company, Fort Cedar. Chad's learning a lot from working at this publishing company attached to the LDS. And Chad has a mindful of nonfiction book ideas that he presents to the board. Chad says that they encourage him to write those books and within a year, he had written several bestsellers, including The Aaronic Priesthood and The Youth of Zion. Not only that, he and Tammy were writing a series for young LDS, like Tiny Talks. Chad is doing book signings every Saturday along with Tammy. And Tammy is signing books for the Tiny Talks series. Out of all those book sightings, he says he enjoys the one where Desert Book Company actually paid him and Tammy to sign books in Las Vegas. Chad's learning quite quickly how to get other authors writing books, and if they weren't authors, making them think that they should become authors to share their LDS stories and their experience in life. Chad is rummaging through his head thinking of all these people he knew that had these great stories that he's heard about. Going out, meeting with those people and encouraging them to actually write a book. This is important to note because this is how he comes into contact with future characters in this story. People like Julie Rowe, Suzanne Freeman, Chad's charisma to get people to bring out those stories that they have tucked behind the walls, the doors, is really like a great charisma that he's able to coax these people to feel comfortable enough to share these stories. A longtime associate friend and neighbor, Dave, he talks him into actually writing the books. He says that the guy was already a popular speaker and his books become one of the top selling series in the history of LDS publishing. While Chad is learning the ropes of being a publisher and running a book company, he continues to hear voices and see spirits. 
And according to him, he's still doing the family research, but it seems to me that it's mostly Tammy doing that research. Chad's face is becoming a little bit more recognizable. People are starting to know who he is within the community that he's living in. And he's thinking Dave's books have been such a success that he wants to encourage him to continue writing. So a couple of months rolls by and Chad says that he sees Dave's wife, Jeanette, in a grocery store. And he says the spirit commanded him, quote, Go tell her that Dave needs to write more books, In quote. Chad is now the managing editor at Cedar Fort, and he tells Dave's wife that Dave ought to write another book. And of course, it wasn't that long, and Dave agreed that, yeah, he felt good about this and that he would work out a game plan to start writing a book and the series being called Made Easier. Again, Chad is growing more comfortable on talking about these voices and sharing it with the people that are in his life. Chad starts to receive these visions and ideas that he is slacking his family research at the temple. And he had someone that he felt was nagging at him that they might have been forgotten in Tammy's family research line. Chad decides to go back, research, and he says, indeed, they had overlooked a family member, and we'll just call her Rachel. Chad describes that seven years have passed since the temple work had been done for Rachel's parents and siblings, and he feels all this nagging is stemming from the family pushing Chad to notice this so that she can join her family in paradise. They submit Rachel's name for temple work. And Tammy, one of Tammy's relatives, her brother, in fact, went to the Provo Temple with his daughter so that they can complete the baptism and the confirmation. In other words, being baptized for the dead. Chad says that he can feel Rachel's presence nearby. And Tammy completed her endowment work. And then Rachel was sealed to her parents. What's important to know is that two days later, he says the same woman that they just sealed to her parents appeared to his wife Tammy's grandmother Lucille. He claims that Tammy's grandmother Lucille had no idea that Rachel was being baptized for the dead. And Lucille said that Rachel had stood at the end of her bed as a spirit dressed in white and shared how grateful she was that she could join her family in paradise. Chad tells Lucille that he has a photo of Rachel taken from the 1800s. Tammy's grandmother, Lucille, looks at the photo and she tells Chad this is the same spirit that she saw. And this incident kind of is the reason for one of the books that he writes and the novel is called Chasing Paradise and you will see a few of their names like Millar and one of the key characters is Lucille named after Tammy's grandmother. Chad describes in his book what Tammy's grandmother's like, that she endured many trials in her life, including being widowed at a very young age. She had favorite swear words and was quick-tempered. She loved her grandkids and made the best of her situation. At some point, Chad is talking with Lucille, and he says they spent a lot of time talking about an her ancestors and how she's eager to see them. Lucille actually helps them continue to finish their family research. In 2005, Tammy's grandmother's health begins to fail. But Chad says that's not the last time he will ever hear from Lucille. And you need to um, keep this in the back of your mind as we move forward. At this point, Chad has been working for Cedar Ford about three years. He said he continued to produce books. But Chad is feeling a bit overwhelmed again at work. He said he was, you know, everything was up to date and everything seemed to be okay. And then suddenly he gets this overwhelming pile of manuscripts. At that point, Chad said he kind of snapped. He went home and told his wife that he had enough. Can you imagine what Tammy's going through? He, she's having to put up with this guy that's on this emotional roller coaster. It's just insane. He claims that Tammy understood 
and at that point he decided to write his resignation letter letter good lord i can't talk he wrote his resignation letter that was a tongue twister for me he said he put it on the owner's desk when he did this chad had no plans no plans of what he's going to do next but he said that he planned on calling to access computer products and see if they would allow him to work for them again chad claims that he turns out a healthy hefty offer from cedar fort if he returned back but he says he turns it down the reason for it is he said that he had seek the temple like he always does for answers and while in the temple he can hear this voice that tells him that he needs to start his own publishing company which we kind of learned earlier and he says my first reaction was oh no no that's absurd as we know he does give in to that voice and decides that is probably something that will work out perfectly for him and his family while at the temple he receives confirmation and he goes home and he talks to his wife tammy about this idea he says she was not happy about the idea and that she knew better than anyone how challenging it would be because she would have to be the company accountant he says tammy agrees to pray about this idea tammy decides she will support chad and his idea to start the spring creek book company within a month they had it up and running tammy's mother phyllis is their sales director he said that Phyllis had many years of sales and this is what really paid off getting this place off the ground by the end of 2004 Chad that company had published 24 books and a few of these authors that he had picked up well he found a few of them floating around on the internet and blogs some of them attached to the LDS blogs one of those people you might have guessed would be Julie Rowe, the other Suzanne Friedman. According to Chad, they moved up to the top position in the market. They were selling so many books that they had to move their large warehouse to Provo, the East Bay, in order to stock the inventory and keep the orders filled. And he said that the LDS bookstores acknowledged their efforts by naming them and their company the small wholesaler of the year and uh, at the i guess it was the lds bookseller convention in 2005 and 2006. in chad's book he talks about working with a few of the authors that he picked up and one of them is suzanne freeman suzanne freeman had actually approached someone that chad knows and tells her about her near-death experience suzanne said that she feels pushed to kind of share the story a bit publicly Suzanne being shy she was reluctant to do so Chad eventually speaks with Suzanne Friedman listens to the story that she has to tell and he says that he's quite impressed with her near-death experience but he wants to figure out if she's telling the truth he doesn't quite or he's not quite sure whether or not she's making this all up so he kind of asks her if she read any other near-death accounts and books and such maybe borrowed a few ideas from those stories but Chad says Suzanne just shook her head explaining that she was a housewife with several children and she really didn't have time for any extras Chad states again in his book before he would consider publishing Suzanne's story he wanted to make sure her account stayed consistent within itself so he bombarded her with questions to see if she would slip up or change her story just he's kind of filling her out to see if she's telling the truth and Chad says that after about 30 minutes of speaking with her he felt satisfied and told her that quote I believe you and he told Suzanne that he would publish her experience Suzanne was also being ridiculed by her family her community and when she was meeting with chad about her experience she kind of expected the same outcome 
So Suzanne was actually relieved to see someone actually believed what she was sharing. What's interesting, when we hear about Suzanne Freeman later through media attached to this story, she never really mentions her involvement and her beliefs too much. But in the book, it says that she actually had been shown the series of troubling future world events while on the other side during her near-death experience. At this point, Chad's growing quite confident in his ability to have other people who are doubting themselves, who are having visions or experiences behind the veil, to feel more comfortable. So this makes him feel like he's kind of a leader of all what would be misfits. Around this time, Chad said that he begins to write his series of, or his book, Standing in Holy Places. Chad says that he's prompted to write these books and this series, but he doesn't really tell you who prompts him at this time. Is it a voice? Is it people from behind the veil? What? Then he mentions almost immediately afterwards that he explained that his veil had never closed up again after his second near-death experience. And as 2006 approached, he is saying that he's writing deplorable future conditions in America. He said these things seem ludicrous to even consider. And during this time, the economy was doing pretty decent. So at this point, I'm going to start moving into Lori's story. I noticed that everything that Chad is writing about is mainly based on him, how he feels, what he wants, and what he sees for the future. It's never a we situation. Even if he does use the word we for his family, it's usually attached to something I, like his visions. It appears there are times that his wife Tammy becomes frustrated by all these uh, sudden needs, wants, and changes he desires. And what's really hard to say, and I try not to judge or be biased in these and let you guys kind of form your own ideas, but one thing that does stand out to me, as well as many of you as I've read, is Chad having mental breakdowns? Or is he truly having spiritual revelation and so when religion comes into play here it kind of interferes with and it makes it difficult to make a diagnosis of whether he's having these mental what let's call it breakdowns you know signs of schizophrenia psychosis of any type so it's very very difficult uh, for anybody to even touch that and even suggest maybe he might be struggling mentally. Because one thing, you do not want to tell somebody that has this connection to a religion like this that they're full of crap and they're seeing things. And this must be something that uh, psychiatrists are running into, or psychological researchers anyways on uh, mental illness, they're running into this issue, trying to figure out how to handle it. And so I found this article. So the Psychological Association had decided to classify strong religious beliefs as a mental illness. So according to the APA, they said that they actually did a study and they claimed that devout belief in deity could hinder one's ability to make conscientious decisions about common sense matters. And they even mentioned the fact that the refusal of Jehovah Witnesses to accept life-saving treatments such as blood transfusions is just one of those examples. So this article was not in the most professional manner and it was most likely fake. But the idea is you know, is this something that could be a reality? Not for all, but for some, like Chad Debo. So one um, physician said, specializing in mental health, that he and his colleagues had often cared for patients suffering from hallucinations and people who are claiming to speak to God, among, you know, other many symptoms, of course. He says, in fact, that it does sometimes make it very difficult to tell apart the religion 
belief from the mental illness and seems you know logical to me but you have to wonder what was Tammy really thinking about this well she must have absolutely loved Chad to death because it appears that there are moments where she's kind of like I don't know about this Chad and I'll give you a few more examples once we continue the Chad story so around this time Lori's working on her second divorce but Lori meets this very charming man by the name of Joseph Ryan. And before we start into this, I want to introduce to you who is involved with Joseph Ryan. So we have Joseph Ryan here. And then in the story, you'll see or hear this name occasionally, which is Annie Cushion. This is Joseph Ryan's sister and would become Lori Vallow's sister-in-law. At this time, Lori is single. She's dating Joseph Ryan. She has one child, Colby, at the time, Goya. Lori and her family are living in Texas, and oftentimes they are in the Travis County area. Lori continues to seek answers in her faith, and she continues to be a faithful follower of the Mormon religion. But as far as I can tell, she doesn't have her temple recommend at this time. Lori isn't feeling too good about her two failed marriages. And on documents, Lori is claiming to be a hairdresser, but there's really not a lot of records showing where she worked very long. The Cox family is very supportive over Lori. They are also there for her during all this drama that she has in her life. At this point in Lori's life, she is seeking for someone who will be very supportive of her. And Colby, also very supportive of her faith and religion. From my research, it appears that she's seeking for somebody that has this very strong drive in the Mormon faith that wants to seek greater things through the Mormon religion. She's also reading books and she's learning about end days. And the end days and predictions that those days are coming are actually wearing on her mind. And it will be one of her driving forces in her past that she takes in her life, direction in her life. Everything is surrounding these end days. And so I'm going to go ahead and close out here. And we're going to begin the next video with learning more about Joseph Ryan, Lori's third husband, Lori's son, Colby, just a little bit. And Lori at that particular time in her life. We're going to try our best anyways to learn as much as we can about Lori's background. Thank you so much for watching, guys. And I will see you soon. Part 7.